to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in Exodus chapter 23, verse number 2, Moses said in the long ago, You shall not follow a multitude to do evil. Friend, we welcome you today to our study of answering denominational doctrines. Today we're going to be considering one of the more popular, one of the more uh, newer religions that is out today in the sense of people are going to it a lot, and that is the doctrines of the community church. What does the community church believe and teach? And so we're going to consider their doctrine and teaching with the Bible. As always, we want to encourage you to have your Bible handy. We want you to look to the Word of God, see if what we're saying according to the Bible is true. Then if so, believe it because God said so. As always, we're so happy that you joined us for our study together today. Uh, the churches of Christ in your area are making these lessons available to you and we want to encourage you in your local area to visit the Lord's Church either on Sunday or Wednesday at their place of meeting at their building they'd be happy to have you attend a service study the Word of God with them if you've got you'll find people at the Church of Christ who love God who are concerned about souls and who just simply want to let the Bible speak in all matters if you'd like to study the Word of God further they'd be more than happy to sit down and do that with you and friend here at the Gospel of Christ through our evangelistic work we also want to help you in your study of the Word of God. If you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons on answering denominational doctrine or any of our lessons on video or audio, we make all of those available free of charge. We'll even mail them to you free of charge. You can write to us, call us, or contact us through our website, and we'd be happy to send that to you in the mail as well. Friend, we hope you'll also download our app on both the Android and the Apple Store for the Gospel of Christ TV program. Great study tool as well that will point you more to God and His Word. Let's turn our attention now to some of the teaching and doctrines of the community church. But as always, we want to begin by making sure that you understand this. I know good, kind, religious-minded people who are friends and neighbors of mine that are members of a community church. Those people are not bad people, they are good people, They're, many of them are sincere people, and many of them are concerned about God and religious things. And so we have no qualm or problem and we're not out to get or make fun of in any way. These people, what we want to do today is consider, is what the community church teaches true to the Bible. If it is, hey, let's accept it and believe it. If it's not, let's just simply obey God and His teaching. And so we're going to reference some of the major leaders in this movement, some of the major uh, larger size community church movements, and while there may be some variance or difference, for the most part, there's going to kind of be a standard among their teaching. Let's ask this question first. In the community church movement, what do they believe about authority, the Bible authority, and authority from God? Well, as you think about this idea concerning Bible authority and what they believe, many believe they are following the authority of the Bible in the community church movement. In fact, the Willow Creek Community Church, which is a very large one today, officially says in their doctrine, in their statement says, the sole basis of our belief is the Bible, which is uniquely God-inspired, without error, listen to this now, and the final authority on all things on which it bears. Wait a minute, what? You mean to tell me there's some things God doesn't tell us about how to live, how to be a member of the church, and how to do things that's pleasing to Him? Well, friend, here's the difference from the outset. The Bible has everything we need for life, and godliness. 
When we think about this idea, let's realize God didn't just up and decide on some matters. God's 2 Peter 1 verse 3, God has given to us all things for life and godliness. Colossians 3.17 says it this way, listen to the all-inclusive nature of this. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. That phrase, in the name of the Lord Jesus, doesn't mean that I can just go out and do something and say, in Jesus' name, and somehow it's okay. That means by the authority of. Acts 4, verse 7, by what power, by what name have you done these things? We are to do everything, to follow God's law, to live our life completely by the Word of God. And the Bible does, listen now, the Bible does thoroughly equip us for every good work. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16 and 17. Well, why then is the community church movement so popular? Here are some of the reasons. Let's talk about this for just a moment. Bill Hybels, who's one of the major leaders in the modern community church movement, what he did as he started his community church is that he conducted a survey about what people wanted. Here's what that survey said. He conducted a survey to find out why people did not regularly attend church. The reasons were these. Number one, people didn't like being bugged for money. Number two, people found church boring, predictable, and routine. Number three, they didn't think church was relevant to their lives. And number four, they always left church feeling guilty, for example, bad about sin in their life. Well, friend, we're not in the business of bugging people for money, but listen carefully. Does the Bible not command us to give? every first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now that's, a, that's something in the Lord's church, that's something that's between you and God. That's a command you have that's only between you and God, and nobody will ever come and ask you what you give, but we are commanded to give every first day of the week. What about this idea that church is boring or predictable or routine? Friend, this takes us back to the mindset of so prevalent in our country, in our society today, that everything is about me. If I'm not made to feel excited, if I'm not made uh, to, be, to, to feel this way or, or whatever, then I, it's been a total and complete failure. Friend, I hope we realize worship is not about me. I'm there to worship God. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. I'm not the audience looking to be entertained by a 10-piece rock band with smoke and guitars and lights and some dramatic uh, play or lesson. And I'm not, that's not what I'm there for. God's the audience. I'm the participant. I am there to honor, to praise, and to magnify God the way He tells me to. Someone said, well, the church is not relevant to our lives. Friend, the Bible is absolutely relevant. When the, when the Bible and not the doctrines of men are preached, when God's Word is taught, you'll never find a book that's more relevant. It tells us who we are, God's creation. It tells us how we got here by the hand of God. It tells us why we're here to serve, magnify, and praise God. And it tells us where we're going when we leave this earth. It's the most relevant book ever written. And then the old idea that People always feel guilty when they leave church. And friend, we don't want to harp and preach on negativity and negative things all the time, but when sin's in a person's life, listen carefully, if you've got sin in your life and you haven't made that right, or if you haven't completely turned your life 100% over to God, when you hear the Word of God, it's going to be hard not to feel guilty. If I'm living right, I ought to feel encouraged and uplifted. But friend, changes need to be made, and that's not necessarily a negative or a bad thing. That brings us closer to God. Let's then consider some of the doctrines of the community church movement, and let's take those doctrines and consider what the Bible teaches one must do to be saved. What does the community church teach about salvation? 
Well, friend, and again, there'd be some variance among different ones, but as a general rule, this would kind of be a standard among community churches. So we ask the question, what must a person do in a community church movement to be saved? The Saddleback Community Church, which has kind of been a model for many community churches, says this, to be a member at the Saddleback Church, you must have a, a personal commitment to Jesus, go through our class sessions, and be baptized by immersion, and commit to abide by membership covenant. My well, friend, as you contrast that idea with what the Bible says, we, we, we notice some differences. The Bible has a very simple plan of salvation that comes from the Word of God. We don't read about a class session per se. We don't read about you know, a commitment to membership covenant. That's not found in the Bible. Here's what the Bible plainly says about salvation. A person must first hear the message of the gospel salvation. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. Once I've heard that message, I need to believe in Jesus Christ. Unless you believe that I am He, Jesus said, you'll surely die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse 24. Friend, to be saved, you must repent and turn from sin. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3. You've got to acknowledge with your mouth Jesus as the Savior. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 10. And then, my friend, the Bible teaches you must be baptized in water for the remission of sins. The Bible teaches that in passages like Acts 2, 38, where Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. And so when you think about this idea, uh, even in the community church statement, it kind of sounds like they teach and believe baptism is important. But really that's not the case. Let me illustrate. Or they don't believe necessarily that it is essential to salvation. Coming from the Saddleback Church, it says, The Saddleback Community Church official statement of baptism says, Baptism doesn't make you a believer. It shows that you already believe. Baptism, listen to this, listen how clear this is now. Baptism does not save you. Only your faith in Christ does that. Baptism is like a wedding ring. It's the outward symbol of the commitment you make in your heart. Well, friend, this teaching and doctrine is very similar to a lot of Baptist teaching and doctrine on baptism, but there's such clarity here. Baptism does not save you. All right, now let's, let's be honest and let's compare what the Bible says versus community church movement. Community church, Saddleback Community Church says, Baptism does not save you. 1 Peter 3.21 says this, Baptism does now also save you. All right, what are we going to believe? And what are we going to accept? Baptism does not save you. The Bible says baptism does now also save you. That's clear contrast. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Baptism does not save you. Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Baptism does not save you. Galatians 3.27, By one Spirit we're all baptized into one body. We're baptized into Christ. Baptism doesn't save you. Now friend, we understand and clearly teach there's nothing mystical or magical in the water. We're not saying, we're not teaching work salvation in the sense that you've earned your salvation, but just like hearing, just like believing, and just like repenting, it's a condition God set forth that to meet God's requirements, to receive God's salvation, I've got to do what God says to be saved, right? And so when we think about this, this idea, we find it very stark contrast, a very stark contrast to the teaching of the New Testament. But one of the things that makes 
community church movements uh, so popular today is that there is such a, a laid back attitude and a laid back dress as it relates to worship. One of the key elements of the community church movement is the relaxed and sometimes irreverent way that people approach God. Here's what they would say. The community church movement would say, and this is right from the Saddleback website, Saddleback Community Church, we're more concerned with meeting your real life needs than what you wear. So dress casually. You'll fit right in. After all, we've got a pastor who wears Hawaiian shirts and no socks. Now friend, I want you to think about the attitude and the mindset. Don't worry about what you wear. We're not concerned about how you dress. Friend, and think, I understand this, it's God that we're there to please. But is God ever concerned with the attitude and the way man approaches Him? You bet He is. In Exodus chapter 3, when Moses came into the presence of God, God demanded that he approach in reverence. Take the sandals off your feet. The place where you stand is holy ground. When we gather to worship God, we want to give God our best. We want to have an attitude and a dress that shows a great reverence toward God and a great reverence toward His teaching. You know, another reason that the community church movement has become so popular uh, is because they don't want people to leave feeling guilty about sin and so oftentimes they never say anything about sin. Uh, the community church movement is popular in that it doesn't address one of the main needs and that's the sin problem. Let me give you an example. Uh, Joel Osteen was being interviewed about uh, the World Harvest Church down in Houston, uh, the one that you see often on television where he's preaching, and he was being interviewed about that, and he was asked in that interview, what are the one of the things that you attribute your success to? And here's what he said. In a Fox News story, Joel Osteen said this, he directly related his success to not mentioning the word sin. A friend, like we said, we don't want to beat people over the head. We don't want to harp on negativity all the time. But the good news is, yes, sin, here's the, the, the fact is, sin separates us from God. But we also want to, by illustrating that we all need that, we want to emphasize and, and magnify that there is a way of salvation. But friend, it's like this. If you never address the problem, have you done anyone any good? Uh, let's think about it this way. Let's say you go to the doctor. You've got some type of need. You go to the doctor, and the doctor is the friendliest fella. He's the most laid back fella. He's the most kind, cordial fella. He shakes your hand. He talks about your kids and your grandkids, everything under the sun, and he never says one word about what's really going on. Here's the lady at the door. Pay her on your way out. I've got a problem. I've got a need. Whether a person knows it or not, they may have that. Friend, the same mentality is true about the gospel. Jesus is the great physician. Like it or not, all men need to come face to face with the fact that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 verse 23, that our sins separate us from a holy and loving God and that we need, listen now, when I think about sin and my need for sin, we automatically want to move people to the fact that there is a Savior named Jesus. He can save you from your sins, Matthew 1 verses 19 through 21, and that He's able to save to the uttermost. Those who come to God through Him, Hebrews 7, verse 25 and 26. There's no, listen, this is the, when we talk about sin, we also want to magnify the Lord and point men towards salvation. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Friend, avoiding the sin problem, sweeping it under the rug, and never mentioning it, we're missing out on great opportunity to help people come in contact with the death, burial, and resurrection and the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, another part that has made the community church movement so popular is that it's often like going to a, a big play or a concert. 
What we mean by that is this. Music as a part of worship is one of the areas where the community church has departed drastically from the teaching of Scripture. The type of music that you will see in a community church movement, you don't find in the Bible. Instead of, uh, instead of singing, uh, congregational singing, well, they might have a 10-piece rock band that plays anything from country to classical music, might have guitars and smoke and people jumping up and down on the stage and whatever it may be. The, the push for the music and the big drama production behind that has become so popular and we think we're going to entertain people to heaven. Well, friend, let's remember this. We're not there to be entertained. We're there to worship God. God is the one receiving our worship. I am not one to receive that. I'm one to participate in worshiping and praising God. It's not, how does it make me feel? It's not, what did I get out of it? It's, what did I put into it? How does it make God feel? That's what really matters. You see, the Bible says in John 4, verse 24, that God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Do we really, are we really focused on how we're going to worship God? Are we really concerned about what God wants us to do and, and how God wants us to live our life in such a way that it's pleasing unto Him? It's not about me and it's not about you. It's about honoring God. Are there benefits to doing what the Bible says? Sure. When I sing, when I pray, when we pray to God, when we take of the Lord's Supper, does that encourage and uplift me? Absolutely. Every time I read the Bible, every time we sing according to the Scripture, it does. But friend, when it, when it becomes man-centered and man-focused, we've lost sight of who it's all about. God's the one that we're there to worship. We're to sing and make melody in our hearts unto the Lord. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, verse 16 and 17, sing one to another and make melody in our heart. That's the idea. And so congregational singing that honors God, that's what the Bible teaches one must do to be saved. Well, friend, let's then think about another doctrine or teaching of the community church movement, and this revolves around the Lord's Supper. What does the community church movement feel about the Lord's Supper? What do they teach about partaking of the Lord's Supper? Well, here's what the community church movement says from the Saddleback website about the Lord's Supper. They say, Jesus never said when or how often believers should observe the Lord's Supper. He instituted it on a Thursday night. In the Bible, Christians observe the communion in small groups or homes. Friend, there's a lot of confusion going on with that statement. Jesus taught His disciples at the Passover how they would take the Lord's Supper in the future, but they were partaking of the Passover in uh, Matthew chapter 26. When you come to the New Testament, here's what we do know. The Bible teaches that we're to come together on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, Christians came together on every first day of the week, and while they did that, they also were commanded to give of their means. One of the purposes for coming together is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, the Bible says Paul spoke to them until midnight and continued his message. They came together to break bread on the first day of the week. They were coming together on every first day of the week. We are to do that until the Lord comes, according to 1 Corinthians 11. And so when we put the apostolic example and the Bible information together, you've got Christians coming together on the first day of every week. And part of what they were doing was partaking of the Lord's Supper. There's the pattern. Jesus didn't, God just didn't leave it up for anybody to decide. God set a pattern and God set a way and we need to make sure that we follow that pattern, that we follow God and that we want to emphasize what's true according to the Bible. And so friend, as we think about the community church movement, it is a very popular, fast growing movement. It is an, a movement that is focused so much on man that sometimes if we're not careful, People can lose sight of the real focus, 
worshiping, praising, and putting God first in our life. And so as we think about these things, friend, we just simply want to encourage people back to the Bible. It is the Word of God that saves us. John chapter 8, verse 32. It is Jesus Christ who is still the head of the church. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. And friend, it's God's plan and God's way that's going to help men and women get to heaven. It's not what I think or what somebody else feels. It's not about taking a poll among our community and saying, what would you like to have? And then basically having a smorgasbord religion. That's not what God wants. This is, religion is not Burger King, have it your way. Friend, we want to make sure that we have it God's way and that we follow the teaching of the Bible and do exactly what God says. And so as you think about these ideas, friend, we just want to encourage you to examine the Scriptures. See for yourself. It doesn't matter what I say. Look at what the Bible says. Or ask yourself, what does God say on these issues as it relates to the plan of salvation? as it relates to baptism, as it relates to the Lord's Supper, as it relates to singing, as it relates to drama and music and things like that, the first and main question ought to be, what does my Bible say about that? As I turn the pages of the Bible and look for God's teaching, then friend, whatever God says, that's all that matters. And I want to follow God and obey Him in every way. And so as always, we encourage you to check these things in the Scripture. If, you're, if you've never obeyed the Gospel and maybe today you're wondering, what do I need to do to become a Christian? Well, friend, God's plan is very clear. In Acts 18, 8, many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. Have you heard that there is a Savior? His name is Jesus, Matthew 1, 19 through 21. Have you heard about His death, burial, and resurrection that saves? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 3. Do you believe that He is the Son of God and He can take away every sin and save you to heaven? John 8, verse 24. Would you turn from sin and turn to God? Luke 13, 3. Confessing His beautiful name before men. Romans 10, verse 10. Would you be immersed in water? For the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2.38. Friend, our encouragement today is let's each make sure that our lives are being lived by the Bible, that we're worshiping God true, and that life and worship is more about God than anything else. May God help us to do just that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.